We begin this morning in Las Vegas, Nevada, where testimony is set to begin at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time in the Widower murder trial. The defendant is 68-year-old Thomas Randolph, and he was already convicted once and sentenced to death for the murders of his wife and alleged handyman turned hitman. But his conviction was overturned by a high court, and now the state of Nevada is retrying him for the murder, but this time without seeking the death penalty. For more, let's head out to Las Vegas, where we find Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter with a recap of Monday's testimony and a look ahead to today. Hey, good morning, Julia. Coming up, this jury will hear more of the defendant's own words after prosecutors culminated the day yesterday by playing a police station interview just hours after the killings. She was moving, and I just stood there kind of for a second trying to see if she answered or whatever. I started to go to order, and then all of a sudden, I just like, I got spooked, and uh, I was just right by the board, and I had to just sort of step back in and grab Jurors leaned in watching the defendant casually recounting his story to detectives. This after the jury heard from the Randolph's neighbor who testified about observing the Randolph's arrive home that night, pull into their garage, but then just seconds later, he heard gunshots. I heard gunshots. Coming from what direction? From the 6517. How many gunshots do you hear? Three rapid gunshots, mm -hmm. like bang, bang, bang. Okay. Then a, a little pause, an, another shot, a pause, another shot, a pause shot. Mark Bartlett was on the phone at the time of the gunshots and noted that police didn't arrive until 20 minutes later. Prosecutors say that Randolph took 12 minutes to call 911, insinuating he had time to stage the scene. I caught up with this witness outside the courthouse. Why didn't you call the police? Yeah, you know what? I didn't hear no screaming and like kids all the time, you know, play around. So I just figured fireworks or something. That's why he asked me about, I heard fireworks. No, I heard gunshots. The delay, what do you think he was doing? He was trying to clean up, cover his tracks. That's what he was doing, to be honest with you. Yeah. Earlier in the day, the state called more of Sharon's friends to testify how she was unhappy in her marriage leading up to her death, wanting a divorce and even going behind Randolph's back to make a will, leaving everything she owned to her daughter, not her husband. Plus, they noted Sharon's distress over her husband having a girlfriend. This mistress, Lizzie Labrador, also testified about urging the defendant to choose between her or his wife just a couple of months before Sharon's murder. And Julia, we are expecting the prosecution to play the video where the defendant walked the detectives through the crime scene just about a week after the killings. It's coming up here in Las Vegas. For now, we'll send it back to you. That walkthrough video, so important. Thank you, Chanley, for that update. Joining us now this hour in Chicago, former public defender and defense attorney Natasha Robinson. Natasha, it's good to see you. This evidence from the friends, the ex-girlfriend, basically these details that Thomas Randolph kept a side chick. He always had a girlfriend when he was married and in the situation of this victim, Sharon Randolph, he was leaving on certain dates and just being gone for a long amount of time. If you're the defense, how do you soften that kind of prejudicial information for the jury who understands he's a cheater, admittedly? Good morning. Um, I would make him as human as possible, but I would not make him perfect, which is to say that even if you don't agree with his moral decisions, what he did uh, in the choosing and selection of multiple women is not illegal, uh, but the killing of them is. And so I would focus on the fact that even though you may not like him, uh, he did not commit these crimes of which he is charged. So that ex-girlfriend, Lizzie Lavador, uh, when she testified, which was remotely, so not as much of a connection with the jury as you'd hope for someone who's in person, but she did give some really important information. I want to play that and get your reaction on the other side. At some point, how do you feel about this back and forth between him going to Sharon and coming to you? How did you start to feel about it? And I got very tired of it and told him it's not going to work anymore for me. He needs to make a decision. Okay, so you give him an ultimatum. Yes. He said he was going to go out and deal with Sharon so we could be together. You remember he didn't come running to you and saying, she's gone, I can be in your life forever, correct? Correct.
All right, you hear the defense there asking her the question. They're getting ahead of that information, seemingly trying to take ownership of it, Natasha, and saying, okay, he may have said that, but it didn't change anything in you all's relationship. What do you think about that moment for these jurors as they're gathering everything? I think uh, they're definitely trying to show, at least the prosecution is trying to show that um, Mr. Randolph is not just an immoral man, but also a man who, you know, commits crimes, commits murders. And the defense is trying to soften that by saying, look, your understanding of what the relationship was, was in fact not really how it was. Uh, I think that uh, there needs to be a little bit more. I know we're still early on, but there needs to be a little bit more about the, the causal connection, the evidence, the crime scene, the defendant's statement, all of that needs to be uh, brought up and enhanced so that it does not appear to be more than just, you know, a jilted lover or someone who was out trying to, you know, play the streets, but someone who is a murderer, someone whose words do not align with the crime scene and what was found. Yeah, can we talk about that causal connection? Because that is the feeling we're left with when we're hearing all of these things about his relationships, how her friends didn't like him. That seems to be anecdotal. It's something that can often happen in a relationship where someone meets someone online, gets married in six months, and now he's changing the will and everything else. But where do you think the prosecution really needs to spend the most of their time? You heard Chanley say that they are going to get into that walkthrough video where they will hear his statement to police and we know from openings there's a lot of inconsistencies but that causal connection between him and this uh, handyman turned hitman allegedly where do you think the prosecution needs to go to really get jurors to understand that he was the mastermind well in the opening statement that uh, the attorney uh, mr. hammer made he said is really really hard to plan the perfect murder so what the prosecution would need to focus on, I would argue, is the planning. Talking about the, uh, the, the, the very, very um, steps, the steps that were taken by Mr. Randolph to plan this murder, to talk about his mindset, to talk about the actions that were taken, to talk about the fact that not only did he speak with police about this, but also that this was a focus of a Dateline episode. And so to be able to really hammer in the facts without saying directly that this is a retrial, to be able to make those connections, to put the links in the chain, to say because of these steps and because of these actions and these words, that that leads to the death of Mr. Randolph's sixth wife. Whether uh, she is the sixth or whether she is the first, the prosecution has to reinforce the fact that there was a life, two lives that were lost uh, in this case and to really hammer down the fact of not only what Mr. Randolph said, but what he didn't say and why if he decides to testify in this second trial, to loop him back into what he has already said, to paint him not just as a liar, but someone who has committed a crime. That is the big question. Is he going to take the stand? We've heard him talk, as you mentioned, to Dateline. That is important that these jurors have heard about that. Maybe it's causing them to wonder what's the real twist in this story because, yes, this is a man who's accused of killing his wife, but one of the things that attracted a show like Dateline to it is this is his sixth wife. Four of them are dead three under suspicious circumstances. I do want to play something that goes to the alleged motive in this case. It's a big part of the prosecution's argument in front of this jury. Let's take a listen to a friend of the victim, Alice Wolf, talking about their, her conversation with the victim leading up to her murder. She leaves everything to my only child, Colleen Byer. Yes. Do you know Colleen Byer to be her daughter? Yes, I do. And looking at the last page of 309, um, it looks like it's 24th of January of 07, and it looks like there's a signature of Alice Wolf, mm -hmm. and then uh, Floyd Wolf. Right. Who is Floyd Wolf? My husband. Okay. So you two witness it, and then it's notarized. Is that right? Correct. 
Natasha, do you find it strange and do you think the jurors will find it strange that this defendant and his new wife, that they were picking out matching his and hers urns early on in their new marriage and that they were getting the will changed and taking out life insurance policies and these are people who are in their mid-50s? I think that it is odd, but I still don't think that that rises to the level of uh, explanation as to this criminal activity. Again, the prosecution has to say not only that this happened, but what is the significance of this? Uh, people make decisions each and every day. However, it is imperative that the prosecution tie in not only these uh, opinions, from friends about what they said and what they didn't say. But why is this important? Why did she change her life insurance policy? Why are they picking urns? Is this just uh, things that people do that are considered to be odd? Or is it because of something that she felt that she did not necessarily uh, communicate and now she has to communicate beyond the grave mm -hmm. and so what the jurors have to do is the jurors have to go with the evidence that is presented but also look at not just the testimonial evidence but the physical evidence is there a reason for why there was not any blood splatter in that hallway is there a reason why uh, all of these occurrences uh, have been have been um, uh, have been described by the defendant, but it has not been in alignment or proof with the physical evidence. And that's definitely what the prosecution is going to argue. And because this is a second trial, so much is on the line because Mr. Randolph was found guilty the first time, but then a higher court, the Court of Appeals, overturned his conviction. So now the prosecution, I would say, this is a second bite of the apple to really get in and hammer out that this person is the one that killed uh, both of the victims, and this is how it was done. You're very right, and it's worth noting that in the 80s, he was uh, prosecuted for killing another wife via trying to get a hitman, and that jury acquitted him, even though that hitman said no and took the stand against him. So we'll see what happens with this trial, where it's really a repeat of them not being able to bring in any prior accusations in front of a jury.